Tech. Uh, these are some journalists that I personally admire very much. And though I don't know them well, by reading them and following them on social media, I feel like I've really seen some of what they've experienced as women of color working in news. And that's uh, what we're gonna dive into today is what it's like to be a woman of color in some of these newsrooms, especially at this time of stress that we're in right now. Uh, if any of you have questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat and we will go ahead and get to questions uh, for the last 20 minutes of our session. Uh, you can either leave them in the chat, you can ping them to me directly, whatever makes you most comfortable. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with you, Prachi. Tell us a little bit more about your experience in the media. Sure. Uh, do you want me to talk specifically about Cosmo right now or about just a general bio about my career? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. I'd love to know about your experience at Cosmo and how that fits into the broader picture. Sure. So, um, so I graduated college in 2009 uh, at the beginning of or the height of the Great Recession, and I actually went into management consulting and did not like it. I quit after about a year and a half and decided to become a journalist. And um, I, I started at Salon um, and I was covering pop culture, but very quickly I was the only um, I was the only person of color in my newsroom. And very, very quickly, I became a lot more political and realized that there were conversations happening and debates happening um, where I was sort of, you know, me and other people of color were sort of abstractions. And so my writing became way more political. And a couple of years later, I ended up covering um, the, the that, ba that basically led me down a path of covering politics, um, which is what I do now as a freelancer. And so uh, a couple of years later, I was hired by cosmopolitan.com to cover the 2016 election, which ended up being the most insane election of, I think, our lifetimes, um, aside from the one that's coming now. And um, so I covered the election for Cosmo. And then after that, I went to Jezebel and covered politics there. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit more about Cosmo or are we do like, everyone get a chance to intro themselves. <laughs> I'm gonna ask um, Pia to intro herself next. Tell okay. us about your experience as a woman of color in media. Um, sure, so I um, am from England and I started out in England. I was um, working as, a, trying to get into journalism at least in, in London um, after I graduated with my undergrad degree and then I was, this, this was kind of right in the height of that recession period. Um, 2007, 2009 was tricky. And so I decided to go to grad school and I came out to LA to go to USC. Um, did two years of grad school here, got my master's in journalism, and then was very lucky to get a job almost right away at Reuters in Los Angeles. And I basically spent more than six years there in the LA Bureau covering absolutely every element of um, news happening here, but mainly kind of with a focus on like the entertainment news and business. So I really got into like how Hollywood works, how film, TV, the industry of all of that, how all of that comes together and works. Plus I covered all the award shows, uh, did a lot of interviews with a lot of celebrities, all the junkets, all of that. So I really got to cover all aspects of entertainment. Um, after six and a half years there, I moved to Entertainment Weekly as a senior writer there. Um, I was there for about 18 months. And then last summer, uh, I went over to The Hollywood Reporter where I was a senior film editor there. And then I left there in April this year. Um, and so, you know, coronavirus impacts, you know, were pretty bad this year, like right, I think within right, like within the first month, we faced uh, pretty big issues with, you know, how this whole situation was going to impact our business. And um, I was one of the early casualties of, you know, the layoffs, the first round of layoffs that Hollywood Reporter had. Um, so I've just kind of been freelancing and taking a bit of a breather after like more than a decade in journalism, almost nonstop now. Um, just to reassess things a little bit and uh, and yeah and, and sort of in between that um, it, my my calling out of variety happened in June and that was uh, another point of me reassessing 
my career and my voice and what my voice is worth in this career, this industry, um, and LA in particular and, and the entertainment world. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. So can you give us a quick recap of what happened at Variety? Tell us <laughs> more about the story behind the story. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, basically, I never worked at Variety. Um, I, but I did, I think six years ago, I had met with the editors there, you know, just a casual meeting. There was no job on the table or anything, but this is an industry where you network. And so it was a casual meeting where I went into the office to meet the, the two editors in chief. And I just heard so much about the culture and it took me two minutes to look around the newsroom and see, you know, very, very white male newsroom reflected back to me. So um, it was a, a good point at that point to bring up my concerns about that culture to the editor-in-chief directly and I remember having that conversation so in June right after you know the Black Lives Matter movement really um, surged again and and got a lot of you know a lot more attention um, you know Variety the editor-in-chief of Variety wrote a post about how she wasn't aware like how she's now come to realize that diversity must start in the newsroom and how she wasn't aware of those uh, pitfalls before as much, but now she's more aware. And I think that really got to me. It was, you know, it, was, it felt very performative, but it also was just a straight up, like, I know I had that conversation with her six years ago. So to say that you're not aware didn't seem genuine in any way. And so I just, you know, I sort of tweeted to say like, you know, we had this conversation six years ago and you didn't choose to do anything back then. I have friends who've worked at Variety since then. I know about the culture. This is a small town, small industry. We all talk. We know these things. So it just felt like a moment where I was like, I have personal experience here where I'm like, I know that we had this discussion and you chose not to do anything about it. So it really that res that tweet of mine, the, the reaction it got, I mean, with from her and then the way it picked up, was so unexpected because I have spoken out about these things privately, at least within the places I've worked. And like, I've just taken those concerns to editors and, you know, I've had those conversations in boardrooms. I just haven't necessarily, you know, publicized those conversations. So the first time I'd publicly chosen to call out somebody in this way uh, for it to have that impact was very surprising. Um, and, and, I, and I believe it's led to some some changes um at least uh but yeah it was it was strange all right patrice tell us about your experiences at with buzzfeed sure um so i came to buzzfeed um three about three years ago um because one of my sisters saw a job posting for a multicultural beauty writer position um, that was the only that that was the only reason I was interested in applying. I typically wouldn't have um, had an interest in working at BuzzFeed per se. It like wasn't on like a goal list, job list of mine. But in the job description for that position, it said that they were looking for someone who had like an expertise in writing for about all kinds of beauty and style and culture for black women audiences, but also um, they wanted someone in that role who could help grow their black woman audience and, and multicultural audience, AKA not, not white audience um, and help to cultivate like a, a loyal uh, audience. And so that was interesting to me, especially because Buzzfeed um, is a predominantly white media, multimedia company with like a large reach. I, and I say that instead of saying mainstream, because I feel like there are mainstream publications that target audiences of color. And when we say mainstream a lot, we usually mean like white or historically white outlets. But anyway, so I, I applied, ended up getting the job, was there for about um, two years before the massive rounds of layoffs they had, um, I think like two Januarys ago. Um, and then I was moved to the celebrity pop culture team. I was asked if I wanted to move to that team. Um, and I said, yes, under the condition that the, the job description 
would remain the same, that the, fo that the focus of my position would continue to be on impact rather than um, focusing on traffic. Um, and I was told that would be, that would remain the same. Turned out to not be the case. I, I was put under a different manager. Um, and, you know, like I said, it just turned out not to be the case. I was sort of penalized for wanting to do and producing content that um, targeted marginalized audiences, black audiences, of course, you know, black and brown people, um, we're a minority percentage of the population. And so a lot of times things that we write for that audience aren't going to get the same traffic that you get if you write for like a white celebrity or a white person or a white audience. And so it, it, long story short, there was a lot of tension and I was not feeling well about my job. I hated going there, you know, every morning. And so I um, said, you know, my objectives career-wise are not no longer aligned with what I'm doing here at this company. And I um, resigned. That was last spring, I think. Yeah. No, last fall, I think. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for sharing that, um, all of your experiences with us. From what you're all describing, it sounds like you've experienced something similar to my experience, and that is being one of very few people of color in a predominantly white newsroom, or perhaps the only person of color. Why was it so important for each of you to speak about your experiences and to do so publicly in, what, as you've all noted, a very small industry in a very small media world? Um. I guess I'll go first. <laughs> so I, I guess my whistle blowing, <laughs> um, I called out BuzzFeed during, when was it? it? It was early in the summer, right around the same time as like Blackout Tuesday was happening. And, um, you know, different companies and brands and just people in general were posting the black squares. And so I, you know, as a black person in America, I felt this frustration, the frustration that, that you know, emerged with these recent uprisings. I've been feeling that my whole life. I was a black studies um, major under, in my undergrad uh, degree, and I've been writing for and about black audiences my whole journalism career. I graduated 2009 also. And so n none of this was new to me. Like I told you guys, I applied to BuzzFeed um, because that position was interested in reaching black audiences. And in my experience there, we had to fight for so much uh, validation of the kind of stories me and my other black peers there were trying to write to reach that audience. We had to fight when it came to things for our employee, employee resource group. Of course, the companies always like to take the accolades, but they don't want to also show you, you know, uh, the they don't like to reciprocate uh, showing you your work. But anyway, long story short, I saw a post that BuzzFeed had um, posted on their main account saying, we value black lives. We're always going to prioritize black lives, X, Y, Z. And, you know, I just thought that was very performative. It was very hypocritical and it was very triggering and gaslighting. And so I tweeted, you know, this is, where was this, um, care and consideration for black lives and the mattering of black lives when I was there. And then I tweeted that and then all former and current um, employees started, you know, sharing their own experiences of uh, being there, there in which they were showed that their lives didn't matter. So Are you proud How did it work out for you uh, and Cosmo? Yeah, so I'll also just go into a little bit about what happened because I didn't mention that in depth earlier. Um, but so I was hired to cover the 2016 election. So I started um, in the summer of 2015. And basically when I started, I asked about like comp time. I, you know, I negotiated my pay and I knew that I was paid just a little bit less than my predecessor who was, who was a white woman. Um, and I, and I felt like, but I felt my compensation was 
fair because I had less experience than her at a time. Um, but I, and I was told you don't get comp time. There is no comp time here. Um, and comp time is basically just like when you work extra, you get, you know, when you work nights and weekends that they'll make an effort to kind of accommodate time off when the, it, your schedule might allow at another point um, and covering an election, like you're definitely going to be working extra hours. And I, I knew, I understood that that was part of the job. Um, but I did ask about comp time and I was told there was none. And so um, that sort of, and then like literally a couple weeks into the job, I met with somebody on PR. Um, so I was told that, you know, appearing on TV and doing media and kind of representing the brand um, and their politics coverage was an important part of my job. And when I, when I met with the PR person in our first meeting, um, she told me that my look was very quote on trend. And I sought, I attempted to seek clarification for that. And it was very clear that she meant that I'm not white. Um, so immediately I felt that I was being, you know, that basically that like me being a person of color, me being Indian, me being Brown, um, was, I, you know, I felt tokenized. Um, and so a couple months in, um, Donald Trump, uh, announced his, like, he floated his idea for a Muslim ban and it suddenly this was being debated on TV on every, you know, every cable news outlet. And I remember that morning um, feeling this sense of alienation and I wrote an op-ed about what it was like to watch this happen and how um, these, you know, white commentators are having debates about something as if this is theoretical and they're legitimizing this debate that should not even be a debate and what it felt like to watch that as a brown person um, and how it made other, you know, other people feel basically the Islamophobia. And I got contacted by several news outlets who wanted me to be on TV. And that was the whole point of the op-ed and to talk about it. And then I was told, well, you can't talk about that. Um, we don't want you to go on TV. And meanwhile, other white male writers at other news sites were appearing on TV to talk about Trump um, from the same organization. Mm -hmm. And they were on all white male panels in, with people like Steve King, who's, in, who's a white supremacist. Um, and, but for some reason it was, I was told it was too controversial to talk about Trump. So what I began to realize was that it wasn't Donald Trump who was controversial. It was me as a Brown woman who was too controversial. Um, because I, my opinions or my, even my, just my facts and the way that I spoke was not going to be seen as quote unquote objective, um, in the same way. And, you know, other things happened where I learned mid year that, other employees, predominantly white, um, were getting comp time. And I had just been the one, the one who hadn't been getting compensation for the extra hours I'd been putting in. Um, I, I had one of the, um, I, I, I realized that my perspectives where I was talking to, I was able to talk to more women of color and have those perspectives on our website. But when it came to, you know, advocating for myself, uh, my perspectives were now suddenly detached from my personhood. Um, and so when I, I interviewed Ivanka Trump and that interview went viral and um, was, was the interview that quote, like set the standard for other interviews with Ivanka Trump, um, according to Media Matters. And, um, you know, by the end of the year, I felt like, oh, you know, I, I think that I've put the time in, I've put the effort in, I've shown that I can do this. I attempted to advocate for myself, I think in the way that Cosmo encourages women, young women to do. And then I was, I was essentially retaliated against um, for doing so. And there was a meeting called with the, with the two editors who I reported to. And they it basically, I was told that I should be grateful to work here. I should be grateful to have this job and that my, my success is not my own, it's Cosmo's success. And that I should never forget that. Um, amongst other things that were told to me. And that's, that's really the moment I knew that I was never going to be seen as an equal. I was never going to rise in this company. Um, I was never going to be treated the same way and my perspectives were not going to be seen as equal and, and valuable. Um, so that's when I knew that I, I had to leave. Um, and that was only, it was a, almost exactly a year into the job, a job that was an incredible job, a career making opportunity that I 
had hoped to stay at for a long time. Um, and the reason that I spoke out was I, I never planned to. It's, it's not, it, you know, it, it was humiliating and it's not something that I think anyone enjoys. No one enjoys talking about this stuff. Um, and I certainly didn't think that it would be believed. It took me a long time to sort of put together what had happened and understand it as racism. Um, so I didn't feel like, I didn't feel safe talking about it, but in the beginning of June, um, the New York Times ran, ran an op-ed by Tom, Senator Tom Cotton, basically that like in, endorsing fascism, you know, sending troops into American cities. And um, a bunch of black journalists at the New York Times protested that and, and, you know, voiced their opinion and they stood up. And then a lot of other people came in to support them. Um, and then a lot of other people were speaking up. And I, I remember seeing a tweet by um, an editor at the Zoe Report. Her name's Clea Underwood and she's a black woman. And she talked about her experiences at a women's website um, with racism and I, when I read her thread, I felt so angry and I felt like this was, this is, this is something that I need to speak up on as well and show some solidarity and my experience, you know, this isn't unique and it happens in prog in spaces that brand themselves as progressive and feminist as well. And I think people need to know that. Um, so that's why I spoke out and I did it via Twitter as I think um, Patrice and Pia did as well, and it went viral in, in ways that maybe I should have expected, but I didn't. Um, so that was really overwhelming, but uh, it, felt, it felt like what was new was not the racism. What was new is that it seemed like white people were trying to listen in this moment, and that if there was a hope for a reckoning or some sort of a change, maybe it could happen now. And I thought about what I would have wanted you know, to see if I were a younger journalist who was just starting out in the industry and something, the things that would have helped me. So that's why I shared, shared it. And you, Pia, tell us, uh, tell us why you spoke out. Um, I think in the moment, quite honestly, it was just, you know, it was, it was sort of days and days of reading, you know, news and being stuck at home and just the kind of heightened situation that I saw this one piece that I felt was very performative and I just felt like I had to call it out. Like it, if you're just looking at it in an isolated way, that is what that one tweet about variety was. But really it comes from a decade of, uh, yeah, like I said, never worked at variety. So this wasn't personal. This was just something I saw that I felt like I could call out and because I was a free agent in a way, I, I wasn't tied to any any particular organization that it would there would be a backlash in that sense. So I felt free enough to just say something, and I did. Um, and it was a performative piece. It was it ran false, and and the fact that it led to a huge reckoning within their own organization that seventy plus journalists had an open uh, and honest conversation. Uh, with the with the EIC and the publisher, and you know, it led to actual um, action being taken. That th there's something to that, and and you know, I think that's a good outcome. But for me, it has done nothing. You know, it it didn't affect my particular career in any way. Um, so it for me, it just came after a decade of being quite often the only woman of color in a newsroom, especially out in LA, the entertainment world is, is uh, not diverse as we know. And um, the first job I was in, I think was the only reporter of color in the office. Um, I think it's hard when you start out and you're in your twenties and you're a young woman of color. I think there are many variations to that you are you're kind of undermined there's a lot of patronizing with regards to your age with regards to your gender and then with regards to your race and there's gaslighting happening and there are you know more experienced journalists kind of finding ways to like you know manipulate your ideas without you realizing um so there's been a lot of that and like me realizing i've had to speak up for myself a lot i've had to fight for you know, raises. Um, I, I spent three years fighting for a raise. 
uh, that was not even a raise. It was just bringing me on par with, uh, with other ma white male journalists of the same level of experience and in fact, less education than I had, but still I had to fight for that. And each year I was like given these, you know, goals to hit and they kept saying oh you've hit these goals we can have that conversation and i kept hitting those goals and those conversations were never happening and i was just like all right i can't like journalists journalists don't tend to like get a huge amount of money anyways and i need to like figure out a way to live in la so we you know something has to change here so yeah i was frustrated that you know we are constantly told in ways that you know you should be lucky for what you have uh, this is a very coveted place to work. And there are many people out there that will kill for this job. So just appreciate this and stop complaining as if we complain all the time. And I never really did. I just brought up when I saw something that really was a problem, I would bring that up. And that put a target on my back. There was one job in particular that actually did put a target on, on my back. And so, you know, and I was laid off as part of that. So it was frustrating that like any time I started to speak out and I've never had an issue speaking up to authority figures, you know, to me, it's like, you know, it's conversations. You should be able to have an open conversation with your boss. Um, but I've also been told by like, you know, my family, Hey, you know, are you sure you want to have that conversation? There's a lot of like, for every conversation I've had with a boss, it's been like, you know, days and days of conversations with my parents and sister trying to figure out, you know, how do we tackle this? There's always a strategic game plan before you go in. And there's also the idea of like, are you sure you want to do this? So I know the risk I'm taking every time I decide to go for it, but I always felt like, you know what, like the worst case scenario, they say no. And really the worst case scenario is so much worse, <laughs> but, but you don't think about it at the time. And I think, you know, now after more than a decade in journalism and really at that crossroads where I'm really trying to figure out where my voice is best used, it's difficult to see a, a very um, progressive path for myself in my career. I was a senior editor at my last job and there aren't all that many positions out there right now. It's, I mean, times are tough right now and I get that, but there aren't all that many positions in general uh, where they would even consider like a woman of color who they experience comes up a lot and they're like, oh, we really need someone with 20 years of experience. And I'm like, yeah, but no, I've worked in all these different, you know, places. I actually have the experience you're looking for you know, don't equate the number of years with the actual level of experience that I have. But I do think it's, you know, frustrating. And I, but I want to, I want to be hopeful. And I think that there is change happening this year. And, you know, I think what Patrice and Prachi have done have, have really created change within those respective organizations. Um, and now I hope that we're getting to pave, you know, even if I stay in this profession or move on to something else, I hope that like I've been able to do a tiny part in like just opening up that door a little bit more for, you know, other, you know, South Asians in the industry, other black people in the industry. Like we need more people of color in newsrooms. Um, and it, it comes down to like all these organizations really implementing the changes from like bottom to the top. It can't just be interns. It's gotta be like senior level as well. So you sound very hopeful that this moment of reckoning in the media, which it sounds like has has, has some long-standing structural issues, might actually do some good in the future. Prachi and Patrice, what do you think? Are you hopeful? Because right now I can tell you, I want to believe, but my inner cynic just looks back at years of history and the experiences that I've had and the experiences that you've all had and I'm trying to channel your hope, Pia. I'm trying to, and I want to. I don't know if I'm all that hopeful, but I'm also trying not to be a complete Debbie Downer here. So this was my attempt at bringing some hope into this. I want to say there's hope, but I don't know. <laughs> Prati Patrice, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I got to say, I, I agree with you. You know, it's, I think as, I think as, you know, people of color, we're used to holding these dualities, right? Like it's, it's not, it, it, it's not one or the other. I mean, I knew that speaking up very little was probably going to change. Um, however, that doesn't influence my decision to speak up because that's, 
that, I mean, I, I want things to change, but I understand that change is slow. And basically the option of staying quiet ensures that things will never change. Whereas when I speak up and it might help other people speak up and then slowly, maybe things can change. So um, I, I, I feel like it's both. Like, I don't, I'm not under any illusion that, you know, the power structures that exist exist to benefit a certain perspective and voice. And as long as that is the case, I don't think that anything can like substantively like really change, but you know, we can have incremental steps um, and you can, you can say, is that good enough? And I think the answer, that's a different conversation. Um, but I think also that the other function that this serves is that we can build community around this. Like we can find each other and help each other realize that we're not going through these things alone because one of the ways in which, um, you know, these inequalities, I think, thrive is where we all feel really disempowered on our own. We are under this illusion that like we're siloed and, you know, everyone, I've spoken to so many women of color afterwards um, who've, who've, you know, gone through similar things. And so many have told me like, I thought I was the only person experiencing this. And I think that is really powerful. It's when you speak up you and you listen to other people's stories, you realize that this isn't a me problem, this is a systemic problem. And then that can help you take other actions that can help create awareness. But most importantly, I think it helps us build community around it because we're not gonna find you know, the power that we really need in those existing organizations. But if we build community, we can build spaces where we can have that power and then maybe build something new. Yep. But you I say, yeah. I definitely agree regarding uh, community and, and collective care and support playing a large role in, you know, creating the change at these publications and in these newsrooms and in media in general. I'll also say that if you notice, there's another common theme between me and the two of the panelists. We don't work at, we, we weren't working at the publications that we called out when we call them out, right? I wish that I, I wish that I had still been at BuzzFeed when there was a sudden um, attention and, and thirst and mattering of black lives amongst a majority of white people here in the US. Cause I would have spoken out then too, that you have more power <laughs> when you speak out, when you're actually still at, you know, the company, of course, the risk factor is totally different because that's where you're getting your income from. However, like, let's look at what the NBA did. They all decided, you know, not all of them, but a lot of teams were like, you know what, we're not playing. How is the company going to make money, which is its ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is not to make friends or family, even though that's sometimes the nice benefit of working at a job. The ultimate goal is to make money. So if current employees can, again, develop that sense of community and, and get on the same page in terms of what they want, why they want it, and be very clear and unapologetic and um, uncompromising, you know, because we've been compromising as black and brown people for our whole you know, existence on this United States because nothing has burned really down. <laughs> if we can just come together and do that radical change, that's when I think change will actually come when we're hitting these companies in, you know, where the money is. So a lot of these companies are often called liberal newsrooms. Why is it that you think that this um, discrimination and alienation and lack of diversity is allowed to really continue in these spaces. I don't know if the term liberal newsroom is is right at all. I think our all our news organizations really are predominantly uh, white and male. So um, even in that space, the the fact is that like journalism, you know, 
just like many other industries has has kind of proliferated with you know editors seeing themselves in someone young and elevating them and if you don't see yourself then you know that person doesn't get that benefit and for you know young women of color or young people of color they don't often have that person in a senior you know position that champions them so um i think that's been a huge problem i know so many people who start out and then you know quickly fizzle out because they don't see any progression um and i think that's that's probably the biggest problem that we want to champion you know the college students who are graduating and entering places on whether it's internships or you know like graduate programs those are the people that need to be really nurtured and elevated and elevated in a way that they see a career progression trust me i'm not in this like you you're a journalist if you're a journalist you're doing it for the passion of being a journalist you don't just do you don't do journalism for the money but money is important it is your job it's your career like I, and i always think salaries are important to discuss i think what prachi said about finding your community i wish i had that i wonder what would have happened if i had even in 2015 2016 had reached out to prachi and built a friendship then cuz I definitely operated in a silo and most of my friends here are white and if I'd even brought up issues at work with them it's very easy for for people to very quickly gaslight you and say no I doubt that's the issue I don't think it's anything to do with that and you but you believe that and afterwards when you start to talk to other brown women and you realize oh my goodness we've all had this experience we've all had to go through it separately and if we had only bonded together and like we could have maybe like fought together in some way so i would just you know tell young people like i think it's on you guys like to to you know be really dedicated in in this space but find your people and see if you can find that person to to motivate and like be able to elevate you you know speak about your career goals openly be ambitious um and and really carve out that path for yourself and don't don't take no for an answer because if other people are doing it you can do it that's something that i feel is like really really important about and and that's how it's going to change the liberal the idea of these like white male newsrooms the only way it's going to change is that you know more more people of color are able to speak up and be accepted and find their own path in those organizations right uh, question oh, for you next, um as you've come out and spoken out about these things I'm sorry, what was that? Have you had any issues with uh, potential freelance clients or future um, hiring managers? Has it come up? Have there been any awkward interviews? Not with me particularly. I mean, I've got, I'm freelancing in other areas right now. I'm not fully, I, I'm taking a little bit of a breather from journalism because I think I needed it and I was so burned out and I did not know that. Um, so weirdly lockdown has has been oddly good for for resting and like really getting that break that i didn't know i needed i would also say uh, you know i've been, my, my parents have brought this up that like should you have really said anything and stirred up trouble when you might be looking for your job a job yourself and i was like probably not but it's done now so uh, i don't know i you know i think it's possible that there are editors out there who might be a little worried about calling me up I, you know everyone's going on about how much they need you know people of color in their newsrooms right now nobody's doing the work like there is no reason that like i my phone isn't ringing there is no reason that like our phones aren't ringing you know we are here we're ready to work and we just want to be like working in like the right spaces and being able to elevate you know others as well and um yeah i think i think it could have had that impact do i regret anything honestly no i don't think i did anything um i don't think i did anything i wouldn't have done otherwise like i i really i try to conduct myself as professionally as possible but i was open and honest in that situation it is what it is i guess <laughs> Yeah, I haven't gotten any uh, rejections in terms of like freelance pitches. Um, I mean, if I have been snubbed or if I will be snubbed in the future, that's a place that I'm not going to want to work at anyway, or a person who I'm not going to want to work with. Um, 
I mind you, I'm saying that, you know, coming from a, a place of privilege where right now, like, I'm supported by my partner, so I don't have to, like, spend for food and, and you know, sleeping arrangements and rent and all that. But um, I don't, I don't regret what I did either. And because I had, because I had so much support and show solidarity in regards to the people who uh, shared their own experiences at BuzzFeed, you know, that only uh, gave strength to, to, to my claims, you know, so. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I, I feel like, you know, this is, after it happened, I was, you know, after I spoke up, um, I was freaking out. I was like, oh, what did I just do? Like, do I need to talk to a lawyer? Like, what, like, what did, how did I just change my world? And um, it kind of set in af at that point, and I was terrified. But what I realized was that the, f the what I, like, sort of bought myself was the ability to, to speak my truth. And all of the sort of internally, all of the shame that I had held for just existing in spaces where I was made to feel less than and, um, you know, the idea, the feeling of like intense gratitude that I had for just being let in the door in places um, that were so prestigious and elite, you know, elite that I felt like I didn't belong. I started to kind of expel those feelings out and realize that, you know, realize my own self-worth and that that shame should never have been mine um, to hold. Um, and so it was actually very, very empowering after the initial like terror of like, what did I just do? And it, I think it also, I, I, it helped me find my community. Like, I mean, now like the, I found Pia through that. Like, I think, um, and I, and I think like, I agree with what Patrice said, like anyone who reads these accounts and thinks, well, that's a difficult person that I don't want to work with. Like, I don't want to work with that person. I don't want to work at that news organization. Like, that's what, that's what this was all about, that we spoke up and of places that did not treat us, you know, treat us with our worth um, and our respect um, in mind. And so I don't have any, um, I don't have any regrets about speaking out. I will say that I'm protective of now the energy around like when I choose to speak out about it. I've had a lot of white reporters, white male reporters reach out to talk about it. And there's always that anxiety around, will they believe me? Will, will, how will this story come out? And I'm, so now I'm careful about who I share it with and what I share. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this panel is because this is a community um, that I, you know, that I feel connected to. And I think like, that's just another thing that I've navigate, been navigating. Um, but yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm rambling now. <laughs> no, thank you all for uh, your perspective. We'll take a few questions from our audience now. We've got a couple in there. Um, what would be your advice for dealing with that feeling of being out of space, of being that kind of only in the room? I never had an issue with it initially because I don't think I ever realized that but once I started it only it only became an issue when I realized um it was a larger awakening really about you know how little we're represented as a whole as as the South Asian community in America in England you know we really are quite marginalized and it's strange to me um to to see that so I I just I don't know it became like this really tricky um, area of like, I, I had to figure out when to speak up, but also not become the girl who was the diversity girl. And that's really difficult because I will say in the past two years, there was, there was a, a senior editor I was dealing with who regularly talked about, uh, somebody I worked with and and constantly referred to them as oh well that person's a diversity person we know they're very passionate about inclusion I said, that person's a really really incredible reporter you should be using them effectively no no but they're just into like only diversity and I just remember being like so frustrated by that it's like you really can't win so I really it had to be something that I talked about sparingly and only in the right rooms when it made sense. 
Otherwise, it would be something I'd be branded by. And I had to avoid that. And I hate that I even had to navigate that. Uh, my advice would be, and I didn't always have this or, or know how to do this when I was uh, younger, like, like just starting out, um, but would be two things. One is try to build that community. If you can't do it in the newsroom because there are no other people of color, like, you know, your friends, your like find, find a network that of people who you feel safe with, who will understand you, who are not going to treat you like you're crazy when you try to talk about these issues and what's going on. Um, I think that's going to be, that's really important. Um, and the other thing is understand why you're in this job and what it gives you and what you're giving it. And that at the end of the day, it is a job. Um, it is not your identity. It is not your life. And, you know, like, like, for example, when I was at Cosmo, um, you know, my goal was to, to basically like, it was really important to me as a woman of color to be covering this election. Um, but I also knew that like that was why I stayed there. So that's why when things happened that felt, you know, when racist things happen, I understood like, okay, I'm here for this specific purpose. Uh, and then when I, when I fulfill that job or I do that to the best of my ability, like I can move on, but it was, it was a job. And I think understanding that it's a job and not your identity and that you can see it as something on your path towards something better um, can also help kind of get through something that's difficult or isolating at the time. What about you, Patrice? What advice would you share with the group? Hmm. In terms of feeling like you're on an island at work, um, hmm, I guess if there are other people who are I, I guess so I, I, I was just very curious if it's in regards to like racial identity and um, feeling isolated in maybe a predominantly white workspace, I would try and again, you know, build the community. It doesn't even necessarily be necessarily need to be um, a community of other people of your same race, right? Um, at BuzzFeed, we had the black ERG and a lot of times we, um, we, gathered with the Asian ERG, Latino ERG, um, to really share our grievances and to work together to try and make change, you know, at our company. Um, I would also say, yes, you might get called the diversity person, you might get pigeonholed as that, but people are going to label you something regardless. I personally, <laughs> I, I sure I'm known as a diversity girl, the, the all, all black everything girl in the spaces that I go to, but I don't think that's necessarily a disadvantage. Um, I think that shows that you are progressive, that you have values that are important to you and that you think are worthwhile speaking out regardless of how you know, you're going to be perceived. Um, so I would say, you know, gonna, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Definitely also, you know, look into therapy. I see a therapist, um, you know, it's great to have a professional to talk to about these issues, especially if you're feeling like, is this just me? Or if you're feeling burnt out from work and you don't have anyone else to talk to, definitely like consider therapy. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we've got time for about one more question, I think. And we had a few people in the group chat ask about uh, kind of the same area. What advice would you have for somebody who might be dealing with a bully or who might think that there's some gaslighting going on or who might be in that position that you all described being in before where you didn't quite see what was happening to you even though it was right in front of you in hindsight? That's a really, really good question. Um, and that's a real issue uh, for me it was very much turning to the people that I trusted in my life. Um, I'm very close to my parents, my little sister, you know, and they are my sounding board, but obviously they're your family. So they're going to be on your side. Um, I think, you know, really finding that community that we keep talking about, that might be it. You know, th there isn't an easy answer to this, 
but I think if you can find your community, find other journalists of color at other places or the same place and be able to maybe just talk, maybe at other places, because then there isn't like a internal conflict in any way, you know, to be able to talk some things out is so important. Sometimes it is a personal conflict. I've gone through those as well. I don't include those in my larger issues of, you know, any discrimination I've faced. Um, personal conflicts will always happen, but I think you know when there are times when those two things intersect and that's very important to know as well. Um, and I think that comes from really being able to talk to people you trust, being able to talk to other people in the industry. Uh, and I just want to say like, I, you, you know, I don't know if I have like a ton of advice necessarily, but you know, I do have like a decade and I'm reachable, you know, I want to be helpful to anybody in this group who has any questions. And, you know, if I can be helpful to you in any way, I am reachable on social media. So please do connect because I think the best thing we can do is to just keep talking. If we keep talking and we keep sort of conversing with each other, I really do hope that like these things start to come out in the open, we can tackle them better and and really make sure we find ways each each situation is going to be different in many ways so there isn't an easy answer but i think that through the community you'll be able to find solutions that will work hopefully i'll also add that it's important that you have as much on paper or on the record as you can so yeah. if you feel try even if you feel like there's maybe a uncertain sort of discomfort, maybe a conflict, you're not sure, reach out to HR and get something on the record with them. HR is there for the company, is not there for the workers, unfortunately. However, it's important to show that you made the first step to show like that you're experiencing a particular issue. Um, if it's, you know, in regards to a bully, maybe your manager, another coworker, make sure you, those interactions are via email, via Slack. Make sure you screenshot the Slack, save the email. Sometimes companies delete things, as BuzzFeed recently got called out for deleting, co -work, deleting workers' emails. Make sure you have everything you can on the record. Even if you want something specified, something that was um, discussed in person, Follow that up with an email, right? And say, you know, just regarding what was said at the meeting or just regarding what that conversation we had in the hallway, like this is how I felt. And then you'll have their response. And then there's that shared acknowledgement that that actually took place. And there will, there's a less likelihood of you being gaslit saying like, oh, that never happened. Or I don't know what this person's talking about, right? That way you can even convince yourself if you start to feel like maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm making it up in my head. So really try and make sure you have everything on paper and screenshot and save to your personal laptop if you have a work laptop. Thanks. what about you? Uh, both of, I, 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 I feel like they said it all. Um, I guess the, the one thing is if you, like I was in a situation where it was a supervisor and she called a meeting and in that meeting it was sort of a tirade. And so for me, for in that situation, I didn't, I couldn't like, like reporting to HR might end up, I might get fired like some, for some unknown reason, or it could end up um, like if emailing her might have been, you know, would have escalated it probably. So in, in that situation, like what I did was I wrote down extensively, like in my, like in my personal notebook, like as soon as it happened. And then I sent an email to like a friend and I talked, so I had it, but I wasn't able to do it through it, like the corporate structure. But again, like to echo Patrice's um, comments, like I you, take notes, like we're journalists. We doc, we know how to document, like document <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Take notes and meetings. That's such good advice. Patrice got nailed it. Like meetings. I always have a notebook and I'm always taking notes as we go along. And as soon as I leave the meeting, I quickly flesh them out. And then you send that email. That is perfect advice. Paper trails wherever you can. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us for your wonderful questions. And of course, thank you, Prachi, Pia and Patrice for sharing your experiences your advice and your perspectives with all of us. And we'll kick it back to Mahir, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about what else is on the Saja schedule. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for a really awesome discussion. I mean, I think this is something that, you know, I, I really, you know, 
grateful for hearing and I, I think other people are too. Um, so just if, before we wrap up, just a couple of minutes, if, if uh, uh, you guys could just stick around. Um, we have a keynote panel on October 3rd and the details of that are now on the saja.org website. So please check that out. Um, it's got some really awesome speakers uh, and uh, we'll have a way to kind of register for that in the next coming days, but just want to let you know. Um, and if you're not a Saja member, please become one. Um, it's free this year. Uh, you can sign up online. It's pretty easy. Um, and, you know, uh, as people talked about, community is super important. I've always experienced that myself um, and we're trying to build a community uh, ourselves. And now I will just kick it over to uh, Ketke, who's uh, joined us. Um, and uh, so, one of the thing, cool things that's happening next week is the Coalition of South Asian Film Festivals is having their event. So she could just tell you a little bit about it right now. Hi everyone, uh, this is Ketki uh, and I'm the programming manager of the Sweet South Asian Film Festival in Seattle. Uh, I'm here to represent COSAF, which is the Coalition of South Asian Film Festivals. And uh, this particular coalition came together uh, in, during the pandemic when we realized that we need to support each other and we need to do something for our audience and our community. And seven South Asian film festivals came together to form this coalition. Uh, the seven festivals are the Swee South Asian Film Festival, which is in Seattle, the Chicago South Asian Film Festival from Chicago, the DC South Asian Film Festival, the Mo Mosaic International South Asian Film Festival in Mississauga, Canada, uh, Nepal American International Film Festival in Maryland, South Asian Film Festival of Montreal, and Vancouver International South Asian Film Festival. So uh, we joined hands and we created this interesting program for y'all to watch between 3rd October to 17th October. And uh, we have an amazing lineup. So y'all can go to www.cosaf.org and check out our programming. Along with the films, we have also uh, managed to bring together an amazing panel for various panel discussions about uh, different things that are important to South Asian filmmakers. So we have uh, a workshop with actor, actress Nandita Das. We have a panel on the distribution during a pandemic. Then we have a panel on uh, the South Asian creators and what they need to do during certain this time. Then we have a panel called Beyond Representation with South Asian Actors, which brings together South Asian actors who are changing the face of American and Canadian films and television. So I would request all of y'all to please log on to www.cosaf.org and check out our interesting lineup and please register and come for our films. If y'all have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, uh, just hope, wish you all a good evening and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Appreciate so your thank time. you. Thanks. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Thank Bye. Bye. I'm just going to end the meeting. Um,